For best results, I suggest you watch this video on a cell phone. Stop me if you've heard this story before. There's this buddy of yours, and he's dating this girl. And your buddy's a great guy. And his girlfriend, she's fine, she's a lovely girl. And they're dating for a year or so, and they break up for whatever reason. And your friend comes over once in a while, and he moans and groans, and you know, the usual kind of breakup situation, right? And then a few weeks pass, you know, maybe a couple of months, and you hear through the grapevine that uh, your buddy and his girlfriend are back together. Oh, great, you think to yourself. And then, you know, a month or two or three or four pass, and you hear that they broke up. And then after that, you hear that they're back together again. And then you hear that they broke up once more. And this cycle goes on, you know, like uh, three, four, five times, six times, seven, eight, nine times, a couple of years. I know one case where the couple broke up and came back together again over a period of 20 years. 20 years. I wish I were kidding. I'm not. It's some people that I knew in college. They broke up and came back together over a period of 20 years. They never saw anybody else during that period. They kept on breaking up and you know they'd go up to almost a year without being together and then they'd come back together. They eventually got married and here's the kicker. They got married and then divorced within a year. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I mean, it was just, how can that happen, you ask? How is it that they can like break up and come back together for 20 years? Why would they do that? Hold that thought. There's this photographer. He's a professional photographer, very successful. He's a professional photographer, you know, the kind that does like, you know, like uh, nature stuff. And, and he goes to these really exotic places like Antarctica and the Gobi Desert and the Himalayas and what have you. And he'll go off for three, four, five, sometimes six months. And then he'll go back to New York with a whole slew of pictures and he'll take the best of his pictures down to the photo editor of his agency, right? And he'll show the photo editor his, uh, his pictures and he's very successful. So he'll show like a stack of a couple hundred pictures and the photo editor will look through them and make two piles. One is a pile of pictures that the photo editor thinks are just not sellable that for whatever reason and he'll set them aside. And the other stack is a stack of the pictures that he, think he thinks he can sell. Right? And that stack is usually much bigger because this guy is a pro. He's, he's very good at his job. Right? And you see, there's this one picture that the photographer takes, right? It's, it's of a mountain. And, and there's nothing really special about the picture, right? And so he shows it to the photo editor and the editor looks at it and it's not a big deal. So he sort of like rejects it, right? And then six months later, he comes back with a totally different set of pictures. The photo editor looks through the stack and there's the same picture of the unremarkable mountaintop. And he sets that one aside. And this happens like three, four times. And finally, by the fifth time, the, the photo editor takes the mountain picture, you know, and he shows it to the photographer and says, you know, why do you keep showing me this picture? I've rejected it before. It's not very interesting or remarkable. Why do you keep showing me this one? And the photographer sort of like sheepishly scratches his head and says, well, you know, that picture, you know, I had to climb to this other mountaintop to take it. And it was such a huge hike and I had to spend the whole night there and I finally took the picture just when the light was right, you know. It was such a hard picture to take. That's why I keep showing it to you. Another story. There was this guy during the uh, depression. His name slips my mind. He was a big time investor. And during the, the, the market crash in 1929, right? All the stocks started going down and he started buying into the stock market as the price of all the stocks were going down. The shares were tumbling in price and he kept buying, you know, and he would always say the same thing, you know, it's going to turn around, it's going to turn around. And he would keep on throwing good money after bad, just buying stocks even as they went down in price. Now. Stock prices, of course, you know, you lose money when you sell 
the stock, right? I mean, if you buy a stock at 100 and it goes down to 90, you haven't actually lost anything until the moment you decide to sell that stock, right? Right. But see, this investor, who was an experienced investor, he kept on buying into the market. He couldn't stop because the losses kept getting bigger and bigger. And he was sure that this time it was going to turn around. This time, when he bought into the market, it would turn around and he'd recover all of his losses. He kept on buying into the fall of the stock market and eventually he was ruined. He lost it all. Now, those three stories sound radically different. Those three stories are exactly the same story. It's not obvious, but the flaw of the three people there, or the boyfriend and girlfriend and the um, photographer and the uh, stockbroker, they all have the same flaw. It's called the sunk cost fallacy. It's very important that you learn it. It's very it's essential that you learn it, okay? And I'll explain why. You see, two Israeli psychologists, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, discovered or, or identified the sunk cost fallacy. And this fallacy is, is key to human nature. Human beings are reluctant to accept losses. They are extremely reluctant. They are willing to forgo earnings in order to not have to realize losses. In other words, you know, the, the boyfriend and the girlfriend who've been together for a year and the relationship isn't really working out because they're just not compatible with one another. Well, you know, they will continue with the relationship even though they both know that it's not a good relationship because they've invested so much time into it. You see what I mean? The photographer who climbed that big mountain and he took the picture and it's not a very good picture, but he suffered so much to get it he will not give up the ghost on the picture. He will try to get it sold. He will keep on showing it to the photo editor who's gonna keep on rejecting it because it's not a very good picture. But you see, the photographer invested so much time and effort to get the picture, to get that shot, even though it's not a remarkable shot. It's not even a very good shot. The investor who chases the market all the way to the bottom, he keeps on throwing good money after bad it's not just in that investor case, you know, I, I forget the name of the investor. I wish it, it, it was a famous guy and he went broke because he kept on chasing the market all the way to the bottom. This happens all the time in business. Businessmen, sharp customers, guys who should know better, they wind up chasing a market, throwing good money after bad, trying to avert the loss. They don't want to accept the loss. They don't want to realize the loss because remember, you only lose when you sell out your position. You only lose when you finally write it off. You only lose when you decide that, you know something, this woman, she's not right for me and I'm not going to see her ever again. That's when you truly lose, but people are so reluctant to do this. You're probably reluctant to do it. How many times have you broken up with some girl and then you got back together with her? Because sort of like you had forgotten how bad things were when you were with her, right? Because that's what happens. You see, you broke up with a girlfriend and you're moving forward with your life. And then you start thinking about your ex-girlfriend and you start to remember the good times you had with her. The time you went to whatever, you went to Disneyland, the time you went to a nice restaurant, the times you were laughing at something that you saw on TV together, right? You had a good time. The sex was great, this and that. And you forget the bad things. See, that's the problem. You keep forgetting about the bad things. And so the bad memories are overwhelmed by the good memories. And so finally you pick up the phone and you call her. And it, the same thing has happened to her. She's forgotten the bad memories, the, the, the fights you guys had and the reasons you had the fight, right? So you get back together and everything seems to be going fine for a while and then the old problems come back up and all of a sudden you're right back where you started and you know that this relationship is toxic, you know this relationship, you should end it. You finally end it and then a few weeks pass and you miss her again, right? Right, it, it's happened to you, it's happened to me, it's happened to everybody. We all fall for this fallacy, okay? And it's much more important than mere girls, okay? 
it's your life. Because if you were to dissect the lives of people who have had shitty lives, you will discover that most of them, they had shitty lives and didn't amount to much and didn't do much with their lives because of the sunk cost fallacy. Because you know what it's called in, in regular language? It's not called the sunk cost fallacy. It's, oh, well, I fell into a rut. And the rut lasted 40 years. That happens all the time. Let me tell you another story. Do you know guys who live at home with the parents in the basement, right? And they live there and they've got a crappy job and they've got all this debt because of the student loan situation and whatnot. And they live with their parents and it's a shitty existence, but they stay. They stay for a year, two years, three years, five years with the same crappy job, the same crappy situation. They can't get out because they can't save enough money to do anything with their lives or start a business or anything like that. They dream about the things that they're going to do, but they never do any of them because they say, oh, well, I'm stuck in a rut. No, they're not. They're not stuck in a rut. What it is is they are unwilling to write off the sunk cost of their situation. They are unwilling to say, you know something? I've got to change. I've got to change everything. I've got to tip over the table, throw everything off, start fresh, start new. They are willing to do that because they are afraid of what they will lose. Because yeah, they might be living in their parents' basement, but they're getting three squares a day. You know, they, they might be having a crappy job, but at least they're getting something, enough money to, you know, pay off the debt and get a little weed for the weekend, right? They might have a shitty social life, but at least they've got the internet and they got like online porn or some crap like that, right? Y you see the problem. You see, a rut is basically somebody who is trapped in the sunk cost fallacy. They are unwilling to break out. And so they stay in the same rut for years and years turn into decades. And as their life starts to end, that's when the regrets start. That's when they start thinking, you know, what did I do? You know, that woman who was with that guy for 20 odd years and married him and then within a year got divorced, right? That one, I know her. I know her personally. She's a friend of mine, right? I told her for years to break up with the guy. She never did. And so spilt milk. But the thing is, see, I know her story really well. She's what, um, 45? Yeah, oh, shit. Yeah, she's 45. She's 45, no kids, and she's too old to have ki children. And uh, she doesn't have anybody in her life. She's got nothing, nothing to show for the relationship, okay? She sacrificed aspects of her career in order to continue with this guy. And they would keep on breaking up and coming together again over the years, right? That was the rut that they were in. That's the rut that she was in. Okay? You're in a rut. You're in a bad situation that's not horrible, right? And so you're gonna stay in it, right? It, it's like the old story of, uh, of the frog in the uh, boiling water. If the water is boiling and you toss a frog in, the frog's gonna leap right out. But if you put a frog into cold water and start turning up the heat, that frog is gonna stay there. The frog is going to stay there. He's not going to jump out. The frog is going to be boiled alive without complaint. Don't let that happen to you. If you feel, if you ever feel that you're in a rut, if you ever feel that things are just shitty and that you're stuck, what you have to do is break out. Don't worry about what you break. You break up with the life that you have. You break up with the gr bad girlfriend. You break up with whoever, whatever situation, break up. Break up is hard to do because it's comfortable and soothing to continue in a static situation. It's comfortable and, and nice. It, it, it makes you feel good to have that stability, even if it's a shitty stability. Even a shitty stability is preferable to change. Lots of times, because we're all human, we're all afraid. The sunk cost fallacy affects us all. And I'm not gonna lie, there have been lots of times when I've been stuck in a static situation and it was miserable, but it was not miserable enough for me to want to change. I needed some outside input, some outside 
spike up my ass to get me going and to break out of the rut that I was in. But it's happened to me, it's happened to everybody, okay? But once you identify that you are in such a rut, once you identify that you are stuck in a miserable static situation that is not miserable enough, then you have to change. Don't fall for the sunk cost fallacy. I'll leave a couple of uh, links below to some books that I've read that I think are pretty good that can help you out. Uh, the Michael Lewis book is actually pretty good uh, because it sort of like explains uh, Tversky and Kahneman and what they were doing and the, uh, the key insights that they had, right? That's a great book to start with. There are other books, but the point I'm trying to make is, see, identify what the problem is. Think about that couple that kept up breaking up and coming back together again for 20 odd years. Think of the photographer showing the crappy picture and hoping that this time the photo editor would like it. Think of that investor who threw away all of his fortune because he was afraid to take the loss. Think of these people. They all had the same story and I'm sure it's a story that you're suffering. If you haven't suffered it yet, you will, believe me, because we all have this problem at one point or another. You have to learn to identify it and break out of it, because if you don't break out of it, you will watch as your entire life vanishes.